Well, thanks very much, David, and thank you everybody for coming along this evening. Um, firstly, can I say what a great honor it is to receive this award. I had no idea it was the last of the medals, uh, <laughs> so I'm particularly honored. Um, as David said, there's a very esteemed list of predecessors on the uh, who have been awarded this medal. Um, and, um, you know, people that I hugely respect. But having said that, I can look around this room and I can see several other people could equally well be up here. Um, so just thanks very much. I came to last year's lecture that was also given by a bridge engineer, and that was very good. And I've got a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. It's a unique opportunity, really, for me to talk about 30 years of bridge engineering. So I'll, uh, here I'll go. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so I chose this, the topic of my lecture, solving problems for a living. And I think that's something that everybody in this room has in common. So will that be apt? Uh, the definition of problem that I'm using here is anything that is difficult to solve or overcome. So in this sense, it might be something that is a welcome or unwelcome challenge. And we have to both deal, obviously deal with both kinds in our work and, and everyday life. So I'm going to start just by giving you a little bit of my background, uh, to set things into context, and then um, I'll give you some examples of problem solving. Um, I'm certainly not gonna try and teach a room full of architects and engineers how to solve problems. So what I say, I think is hopefully gonna resonate rather than necessarily educate, but um, hopefully you'll find it interesting nonetheless. So my career has been pretty much entirely spent in the design of bridges. Um, and I want to start with my earliest days in at Southampton University, uh, but not at university as such, but actually my summer placement work, which I was working for the Ministry of Defence, and I worked at the Royal Armaments Research and Development Establishment in Christchurch. Some of you may know, but it's now closed down. It used to be called the Military Engineering, um, Military Engineering Experimental Establishment. That's it, MEXI. Those of you who've done the MEXI method assessment of arches, that's where it came from. The other thing that it's famous for is for the invention of the Bailey Bridge. And that's a fantastic story of problem solving in its own right. Apparently Donald Bailey invented it on the back of an envelope. Uh, so great, great, great uh, classic example. Um, I was working on a design of folding tank bridges in the bridging division, uh, but there are many other departments there uh, one of which was uh, the countermine department, where they designed weird and wonderful devices um, which are used to clear minefields, such as the, the, the flail uh, tank that's shown here. Um, so one, on one day whilst I was working uh, in the summer, I was uh, talking to one of the majors who ran the countermine department. I sat down in his office, meek little me, listening to him expounding on this, that, and the other. And he was venting about um, some frustration they had in terms of bureaucracy and, and not being able to get something done. And uh, it was that point that he, he said something that really stuck with me. And his advice was, if you have a problem, address it. Don't ignore it, at least consider it and do something about it. And for whatever reason, that has really stuck in my mind. I think what it is, is that I imagine this very experienced soldier on his belly in a minefield prodding for mines with a bayonet. And at that point, any problem that you have is obviously very immediate. <laughs> and you need to address it. And, and as human beings, we have a lot of avoidance strategies when confronted with challenges. And 
if you look at a lot of the recent high profile scandals and failures, you'll often find that it stems from some sort of complacency or denial um, and inaction. And I think those major words have really just stuck with me ever since. So when I graduated from university, I joined G Monson Partners, where I worked for 12 years, mostly on major infrastructure projects in the UK and Asia. I was very rough, uh, very um, fortunate to spend roughly uh, half of that time on site. So um, got a lot of good practical experience. And I think it's a bit of a sadness, to be honest, that our engineers these days don't get exposed to that sort of experience, the resident engineer roles being diminished, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure that's a debate that's um, often had in these, uh, within these walls. One of the highlights of my time uh, with Malta was uh, 18 months spell in Hong Kong, uh, working on this bridge, the Cap Shumun Cable Stay Bridge. Again, I was based on site for that. And it was just a very good grounding in basic engineering. Um, this is my folder of notes I amassed during that time, which I still continuously refer to. Uh, and there's mostly photocopied pages of the senior engineering mentors that I had at Monson. So then in 2001, I joined the fledgling bridge group at Burehapel. That's really where I got the opportunity to put some of these skills that I'd learned into practice in a, in a more creative environment. So I've been very lucky to work on a big variety of projects amazing projects all around the world, some of which are illustrated here. So one thing in common uh, with, for all of these projects, they're all bridges. There's always one problem to solve at least because by definition, a bridge crosses an obstacle. So the question is, how do you build it? So we, as a bridge engineer, we've always got to confront that question and nobody should design a bridge until they know how it's going to be built. The other thing that I've learned over the years is that good engineering is not just about big picture, big gestures for the, the overall concept of something. It could be applied at all levels. So no matter what it is, it could be a bolted connection. You can apply creativity and ingenuity to all levels of bridge design. And with bridges, it's not like a building. The details are exposed, so you need to take care of those. This is the M8 Hart Hill footbridge between Glasgow and Edinburgh on the busiest motorway in Scotland. This was assembled alongside the, uh, the road and lifted into position using a very large 1200 ton crane. So we had to consider how this was going to be built in terms of when we were when we were designing it, the permanent works design had to take account of the lifting condition, but also we had to design very discrete lifting points on the bridge. So you can hardly see them, but actually on the top of this, there are four lifting points where the, the slings from the crane could be attached. They couldn't be removed afterwards, and there's pretty substantial load to be supported there. This is the cross section. It's a helical truss, which wraps around some longitudinal cords at the top and the bottom. And this was a really critical detail. So this is the connection between that helical truss, tubular members of that, and the tubular members of the longitudinal bonds. And uh, we wanted to have a, a very visible wrap around of the helix. So it had to be distinct from the Cords, but obviously, if you have a big eccentricity, you're going to get lots of effects to design for. So the detailing of that was had to be just right. It had to be just big enough that you can get in and do good welds, um, but not too large. You're going to introduce lots of eccentric loads into the structure. And there are lots of other nice details on this bridge. Just uh, one other example there. It's the pin connection at the top of the um of the B columns. But again, that was 
all sort of developed because of the construction methodology. We had we couldn't have a welded connection there, and a big cluster of bolts would have looked awful. So a pin is much the nicest solution. Okay, this is the town centre link at uh, Stratford Station. It's a weathering steel truss structure. It crosses 11 railway lines and all the platforms of the station. Um, and it was incrementally launched in three stages. So you can see we've got a launching nose there to shorten the cantilever. But nevertheless, the construction condition did govern many aspects of it, its design. The bridge is conceived as an urban piazza. So it's very important there's good visibility along it and it, it, it didn't want to be an enclosed space. So it's fully glazed on both sides in order to um, afford good views and also to avoid this sense of uh, being hemmed in. The truss, being weathering steel, one of the things that we've got to really be worried about is, is getting rid of water. Um, we need to avoid bonding and, and so on because that's uh, an issue. So what we did there was we had very heavy sections uh, for the truss, uh, but they were, they were covered by padding plates shaped to form this sort of picture frame uh, arrangement. And that naturally introduced drip details in order to get rid of the water. Um, as well as that, all the visible welds are in the cladding plates, which are small and they weather down and you can hardly see them. Whereas the, the big members behind them are, you know, they, they have to have large full pen welds and very, very uh, visible. And this is the Northern Spire. This is the bridge over the river. We're in Sunderland. It's 330 meter long. Uh, cable state bridge with a 90 meter high steel pylon. Uh, all of the steel work was delivered to site by sea and the, the pylon was delivered in one piece and raised vertical using strand jacks. So this is a stage of the construction process. Uh, the, the deck was launched it was launched in two phases. So this is the first phase of the deck launch has been done. The pylons be brought in and it's just being raised uh, vertical using the strand jacks. As you can imagine, the design of the permanent works is very much influenced by the temporary conditions that we've got going on here. So the pylon had to be designed to be horizontal as well as vertical. Not only that, we had to do wind tunnel tests because there was a condition where it would be vertical, but no cable stays would be attached. And we had to check its aerodynamic stability in that uh, condition. The deck had to be designed for all the various stages as well. And we had to introduce a preset and pre cambers which meant that we achieved the final profile at the end of the, the deck launches. Many details on that bridge, I just, highlighted this one here, the cable anchorage. Just a really simple, efficient, neat design. Um, hopefully illustrating my point about taking care with these things. Okay, so hopefully that's done enough to emphasize the importance of construction. So there's one example there over uh, water, one over rail and one over road, so they covered all bases. Um, I'm now going to look into a bit more detail into uh, some problems that we encountered on projects, and I'm going to go back to a bridge in Hamburg over the Backenhafen. This is uh, Hatton City. Um, it's an aerial view uh, of an area which has been redeveloped rather like London's Docklands. And this is the Back and Huffen. It's a bit of a cul-de-sac within the harbour. Our bridge's location here is here. So although it's a cul-de-sac, there's still a possible need for ships to be manoeuvred into that space. Um, 
this is a museum ship and that travels around and may at some time be moored within that harbour, but there are other reasons why we might need to, to have navigation through there. So whilst it didn't need to open frequently, we did need to design the bridge to be movable. So the solution was to avoid having a mechanism, but to have a lift out section in the center. Uh, and we came up with the concept of a Gerber system with um, moment releases at the points of inflection within the main span there. It's quite a wide structure. There's um, three lanes down the center uh, with cycle paths. And then on the outside, there are footways which are uh, cantilevering and they um, undulate in plan. There are uh, terraces uh, for people to sit. So actually it's quite substantial in its size, 27 meters at its maximum in width. And the lift out span being 36 meters to provide the required navigation uh, space ended up being 400 tons. This is a cross section through the structure, give you some idea of what it looks like. Uh, the shaded elements, they're the main longitudinal box sections, and then there are a series of cross girders connecting them, and of course the, the V-shaped uh, supports. So the question is, how to lift 400 tons? So what we need here is not so much lateral thinking as vertical thinking. Well, option A is to just use cranes. And that would work, but it would be very expensive because the cranes that we need are pretty large. And the client wasn't too impressed with that suggestion when it was costed out. So we fought again. Second option was to employ some bespoke um, temporary works and use strand jacks to lift this section out and lower it down onto a barge and move it out of the way. Again, there was a, a feasible solution, but it lost a lot of the benefits of having a lift out span rather than a permanent mechanism. Because you've got all this temporary works, you've got to maintain it, you've got to inspect it, test it and all the rest of it. So after some thought, we decided to use the tide. Now it just so happens that Hamburg has got a tidal range of four and a half meters, which is um, plenty to lift a, a, a span out. And uh, given that this didn't need to be a frequent operation, it was perfectly acceptable for it to take a bit of time. So the principle was basically to bring in a barge with some temporary trestles underneath the lift out section. We've designed some points where those trestles could connect. And then we just wait for the tide to rise until we've got sufficient clearance. And then when tugs can just move the, um, the span out of, out of the way. And then we've got the ship can go through. Now, taking the section out is one thing, putting it back again is another. <laughs> so we designed all kinds of clever sliding pads, et cetera, to, to help guide it back into position, jacking points as well. So if necessary, it was possible to maneuver the span back into its <laughs> correct location. And this is, this is just illustrating the tide. Uh, we needed two and a half meters. So we didn't need to wait for spring tide, it was, it was achievable virtually all, all year round. Um, so two hours to position the barge, then wait three hours for it to rise with the tide. And then you've got plenty of time to move it out. And it, it, it's a, a good solution, I think. That's just the replacement. And then this is just a very short video to show it. The operation in action in 2019. 
<laughs> yes, please. The good thing about it, of course, is you've got plenty of time to maneuver it as it goes down and it in it back into its correct position. So a truly sustainable solution. Um, and, uh, you know, obvious with hindsight, perhaps, but I suppose all the best ideas are. So next example, um, having said that I spent all my time working on bridges, actually more recently, I've also been involved in overhead line gantries for railway electrification. So this example is the Elizabeth line. Um, most of you will know that it runs from west to east through London. Uh, and outside that central tunnel section, it uses the Great Eastern and Great Western uh, infrastructure, the existing infrastructure. So part of this uh, scheme to the Elizabeth line was a complete upgrade of the overhead electrification from one end of the Elizabeth line to the other. And that new electrification system would apply different loads to the gantries and it would apply them in a different way as well. These are the gantries of the Great Eastern. They date back to the 1940s. So some of these 75 years old, it's the original electrification. Um, but mostly portal structures for all manner of different varieties. And some of them will have been modified during the course of time. This is the Great Western. Um, more modern gantries, uh, rather than portals, these tend to be cantilever structures or headspan structures where you've got uh, cables tension between masts from which the catenary and the contact wires are suspended. So Network Rail had commissioned an assessment of all of these gantries to see if they were suitable for reuse using the new electrification equipment. And um, it had been determined that the vast majority failed that assessment. However, these structures have been in service for a long time without any problems. So there's quite a bit of skepticism at Network Rail as to that conclusion, whether it was not right or not. So they commissioned us for a second opinion. Um, now there are 570 gantries involved in the two areas, and we were given 12 weeks to review each of them. So that's less than an hour per gantry. <laughs> so how on earth were we going to do this? Well, the first part of the, the challenge is actually amassing all the various information that we would need. Uh, we used multiple different sources as listed there. We also had Network Rail's uh, engineers in our office for some time, just helping us to try to decipher the Dead Sea sc Scrolls, which were these, uh, <laughs> these old drawings and uh, the various bits of information. What we did was we, we once we've done that, we try to categorize all of the structures into families. And then in each family, we identified a worst case structure and we concentrated on looking at that. And then if the worst case structure failed, we would then look more in, in more detail at that particular family. But in some cases, it was possible to, to, to just look at the worst case and say that that was okay. So this is a typical overhead line gantry. All the various loads that you have to consider, wind, ice on the wires and the structure um, and uh, thermal effects as well. So the, the new overhead line equipment differed from the old, the previous equipment because it's attached using registration arms, which can move as the wires expand and contract away from a fixed point, which could be uh, 1.2 kilometers away. So what that means is that any lateral loads applied by the wires to the structure are applied eccentrically to it, the plane of the structure. So that's a destabilizing effect. So whilst the loads weren't necessarily a lot higher 
than the previous loads. They were applied in a different way, so we did really need to, to look into it. We started with a similar process to what the original assessors had done. We used static analysis. We looked at um, the connections. We also needed to check serviceability conditions because actually the wirement occurs if the structure deflects too much. So that's important to check. But when we'd done all that, we, we reached a similar conclusion to the original assessors. So what we then did was um, we realized that most of the failures that were occurring were in slender structures, particularly the slender portals of the Great Eastern. Um, and it was lateral torsional buckling failures. So we then applied a more rigorous nonlinear analysis uh, process to those structures. We modeled them uh, explicitly. Uh, we in, uh, introduced uh, suitable initial imperfections into the structure and we used material and geometric nonlinear analysis to direct, get a direct utilization of the structures. So having done all of that, after 12 weeks, uh, we, we were finding favorable results and Network Rail were at that point happy to give us a bit more time to really check all of the assumptions that we'd used as the basis for our uh, assessment. So that included um, some material testing, that included going out and inspecting every structure to check that our interpretation of drawings was correct and nothing had changed. Also to check the condition. So quite commonly, the, the structures would have suffered corrosion at the base of the mast where water collects and over time causes the mast to, to, um, to corrode. And in the end, this is the this is a summary of the outcome. So 570 structures were originally in the scope. Um, when we did the linear results, three quarters of them failed the assessment. And then when we uh, did the nonlinear approach, it was pretty much the opposite conclusion. However, we still wanted to deal with the the remaining structures that were failing. And so we devised some strengthening uh, measures. So this is a strengthening collar, it's split, so it can be put around the base of the mast filled with concrete uh, during a very short period of time on site. And that deals firstly with any issues of corrosion at the base of the mast, also stabilizes the mast uh, against buckling. And then one of the other common structures that was failing was lattice type uh, portal structures. And we put some extra members into the, into the mast there. So having done all of that, the situation was improved still further. We only had six of those 570 structures, <coughs> excuse me, um, that needed to be replaced. We'd managed to save all the rest. So it's a pretty successful project from Network Rail's point of view. Um, apart from the cost saving, the program saving is probably the biggest thing really from their point of view. Uh, the portal frames cross over four, four lines. So to get possession to replace one of those is quite a, a big deal. Um, but also the carbon saving and the saving of, of, of of our heritage, you know, some of these structures, uh, they're, they're perfectly good uh, to continue in service. So, right, slight diversion now from all these examples. Just going to introduce a few of my own thoughts about problem solving. And these are general to any kind of problem. This is pretty obvious perhaps, but it's very, very important. I can increasingly find that defining the problem is often the way to, to see the solution very clearly. Often the solution becomes obvious when once you really clearly express what the problem is. Second point is, 
to always test assumptions. Some of the greatest breakthroughs in, in all fields have been when somebody has thought about an assumption that has been seen to be universally accepted and uh, wondered what happens if you don't make that assumption. So I find I have a kind of instinctive need to do that whenever I see a brief, you know, does it really need to be this wide? Does it really need to be that span? Could it be somewhere else, you know? I think you need to give space for solutions to merge. So notice that I say space and not time. I don't think there's a necessarily a time limit on getting a solution because it could just be instantaneous. But if certain ways that we tackle problems are not necessarily the most productive, when you just focus on an outcome, right, we're going to sit here and the next hour, we're going to come up with a fantastic, imaginative, creative idea. Right, let's go. It's not going to work. Sometimes solutions just emerge in their own good time and when they're least expected. There's the old thing about something popping into your head in the shower because you're relaxed, you're in the right frame of mind to be thinking creatively. Now this is perhaps needs a bit of explanation what I mean here, but I think it's important not to start by generalizing without considering specifics. It's not always true, but I think it's a mistake that I often see happening in engineering and, and outside engineering. So somebody will say, right, this is what we're going to do without having looked at the specifics of a situation and uh, analysed it properly at all. So an example for bridge engineering might be, right, we're going to do a cable state bridge on this site without actually thinking about site constraints and allowing those to dictate what the form of the structure should be. Or dare I say it, Somebody who says, right, this is how long we've got to do the detailed design without actually looking at what that entails and how long it should really be taking. So just imagine with the overhead line example I've just given, if we said, right, these are the families we're going to divide it up into before we'd looked at actually what structures comprised, it would have been a complete waste of time. Another example from my past was... Uh, a particular project quite a long time ago when we were a bit up against it time-wise and uh, the design was behind but we needed to start drawings and I had the idea right let's let's just start by producing some general details because surely they'll be useful but um, of course what happened was as soon as we got to do the detail design we found that no none of the specific details were in any way resembled the general details that we do we come up with so again it was a waste of time you have to work from the specific to the general um it's not always true but it's it's something to that, that I, I see crops up a lot and then this is my favorite expression uh right now life is simple but not easy I think quite often we know the solution to our problems. We just don't like them. <laughs> we try to avoid them. The resistance, the lack of acceptance. Um, sometimes, yeah, one just has to accept that. So just a few random thoughts perhaps, but, and then it's by no means an exhaustive list. It's not a, a uh, it's horses for courses with any of these things. Okay, a couple of resources which I thought I'd mention as well. So the first is a, a, an e-book that you can get online if you search for it. It's called Time Management for Creative People. Um, but I particularly like the, the, the strap line, Manage the Mundane, Create the Extraordinary. And it's by a chap called Mark McGuinness. So I, I recommend that if anybody wants to have a look at it. And the other resource that I use a lot is mind mapping. And uh, if you haven't tried it, 
I would I would really recommend that you do. Um, I much prefer the analog version, but there are digital versions for those of you who can't bear to use a pen or a pencil anymore. Um, but yeah, I do it all the time and I, I just think that it actually reflects the way our mind works a lot better than any other form of note taking. Right, on to the Lille Langebro. So this is a bridge in the middle of Copenhagen over the harbour. Uh, the arrow shows its location. It's right next to another bridge called the Langebro, which is on the main thoroughfare northwest, uh, north south through Copenhagen, called Hans Christian Andersen Boulevard. And that's an extremely busy road. It's raised above the harbour. It's a very uncomfortable uh, place for pedestrians and cyclists to be, and hence the need for a new bridge at a lower level. And this is the design of the little angle that we came up with. So it's a slender, low level crossing. Um, it's designed not to compete visually with the, um, with the Langebro. And also the idea is that people using it will get a nice view of the harbor and the city and so on. Um, it needs to be low level to avoid long ramps on either side and therefore it needs to be able to open to allow ships through the navigation channel. Its alignment is dictated by the desire lines at either end and also the need to get some clearance underneath it for the very smaller vessels to pass through it. So there you are, you can see this explains, I think, how the bridge opens. It's a swing bridge with two, the four sections the two sections either side of the navigation channel rotate to allow shipping through. And in the background there's the, that's the Langebro, that's the Bascule Bridge. There's another view of it. So this is uh, the articulation of the bridge, showing the four different sections and the movement joints either side of the central section and the mechanical connection, which is needed when the two parts join back together to make sure they're correctly aligned. And ordinarily, that would be a pinned connection. Most moving bridges have a pinned connection to achieve that. But our problem was that a pinned connection wouldn't achieve the sort of slender structure that we really wanted to achieve here. So pinned connection would have meant would have meant deep sections over the adjacent piers because of the cantilever that's necessary over the, the navigation channel, which is 35 meters. So it's a pretty large navigation channel. So there's the pin connection. So when the, when the bridge, um, the bridge has to cantilever under its self weight, there's nothing to do about that. When it joins together, if it's a pin connection, uh, there's really no benefit structurally. It still has to effectively act as a cantilever under any imposed loads. So what we thought about doing was to introduce a moment connection rather than a pin connection. So with a moment connection, where they're making much better use of the structure, um, you can see that we still got to treat the structure as a cantilever under its self weight, but once it's connected together, it's continuous for um, imposed loads. And that means that we can have a, a more slender structure all the way across. And the key aim was really to keep the depth of the structure down below the depth of the parapet so that we don't interrupt views across the harbor. So a moment connection, how do we do that? So this is how it works. On each side of the bridge, there are hydraulic cylinders. There's a top cylinder, which is a compression cylinder that's got a pin on the end of it. And there's a, a bottom cylinder that's a tension element, and it's got a sort of hammerhead on the end of that. And then on the other side of the connection, there is a compression socket. So it's a shallow socket so that the pin doesn't get jammed in it. 
And then this sort of mouth is what receives the hammerhead. So this is the sequence of, of the bridge closing. There are various wheels and tracks which actually align the bridge sections vertically as they come together. So this connection doesn't have to do that job. Okay, so once the connection pieces are opposing one another as shown, what, first, what happens first of all is that the compression pin is driven into the compression socket. Then the tension element is energized and the, uh, the hammerhead bears on the inside of that mouth element. And then a preload is applied to the whole system. And the, the cylinders are locked off. And at that point, we have a moment connection. And if there is load imposed on the structure to increase the moment in the middle of that span, then the pressure in the cylinders will increase to incre increase the resistance at that point. The cylinders are the same bore and they're hydraulically linked together. And the, what happens then is that if there is an expansion or contraction at that point, then oil can flow from one cylinder to the other and that permits that movement to occur. So it's effectively axially released, but it's a moment connection. So we're not building up stresses due to thermal effects at that point, but we are resisting any moments that are applied. So this also has benefits in terms of the stiffness of the structure, and particularly in terms of the dynamic response of the structure, because it's much, much stiffer. But also, if there is any movement at that connection, it acts a little bit like a damper because oil is flowing from one cylinder to the other. So there's <clears throat> multiple benefits from that solution. And there's just another image of the completed bridge. <clears throat> right, so, so far we've, uh, we've raised 400 tons without any machinery. Uh, we've saved 570 gantries from certain death. <laughs> and uh, we've invented a new kind of swing bridge. So what, what's next? Okay, well, problem solving, I think, is the ultimate transferable skill. So, so I've been talking about bridge engineering because that's something that I know a little bit about. But, you know, it's not just engineers who use problem solving. Many, everybody use it, uses it to a greater or lesser extent in their everyday life. Um, you can imagine that other professions have an equal need to be good at problem solving. You know, software developers, uh, politicians, um, medics. <clears throat> Are we born with this ability? I would suggest it's something that is learned through experience and improved with practice. So looking at our education system, I think it's a bit unfair to say that there's no uh, there's nothing done to encourage original thought, but I think there could be more done to encourage original thought. I've had three children go through the system, and I think there is scope to improve the way that we teach these sort of skills. We're now in the age of artificial intelligence, and it's perhaps becoming less and less important to be able to re remember lots and lots of facts. <clears throat> it's more important to be able to apply that knowledge. Um, unless you're a, a pub quiz contestant or a game show, um, somebody on a game show. Um, so with all this AI, I think where we still need the human mind is in the area of creativity and innovation. So maybe these sort of techniques should be being taught almost as a separate subject at school. There's no shortage of problems in the world right now, as I'm sure everybody is very conscious of. 
Um, but it's amazing what we can do when we put our minds to it. Uh, we all in our pockets have a smartphone, which has got power, which would have been unimaginable 20 years ago. And yet here we are. But that power has been come about because of an incredible amount of investment of intellectual resource. So I think when we look at the world's problems, we should ask ourselves, is it because these problems can't be solved? Or is it because we're not putting enough effort into solving them? Have we got our priorities right? So just a small example, the uh, Call of Duty video game has got 3,000 developers working full time on it. And they're 25 billion hours have been spent playing it. Now, I don't want to pick on anybody who likes video games, but it just goes to show, you know, just imagine if that sort of investment was made into some of these in so-called intractable problems that we've got. Just makes you think, doesn't it? So we hear a lot about problems which need to have solutions. We also hear about when they're needed and why they're needed. But what we really need is to know how they're going to be solved. So I think what we really need is to train a new generation of problem solvers in all fields who can use the unique gifts of human intelligence to think outside the metaphorical box. So as I said at the start, I feel very lucky to have had the opportunities that I've had. But all of the projects that I've mentioned have been a team effort. I've deliberately not tried to credit anybody as I've gone through. I hope you uh, forgive me for that because it would have been impossible to do it and I would have forgotten somebody. Uh, but needless to say, there have been a, a huge number of clients, collaborators, architects uh, and, and colleagues who have, have worked on these projects. Um, the only thing I would like to do is to say a big thank you to my uh, bridge team at Bureau Happold. Uh, without whom much of what uh, you've seen would not have been possible. So this, this award is as much a recognition for them as it is for me. I'm just going to leave you with a quote from uh, one of the most famous of bridge engineers, which I think is particularly apt uh, in light of what I've been talking about. Hope you hope you found it interesting and look forward to perhaps a few questions and a bit of discussion. Thank you.